Okay. Well, thank you for participating in this presentation on Belva and Lockwood for the Macedon Public Library. This is an historic year this year, and I don't mean because of COVID-19, I mean because it's the 100th anniversary of women getting a constitutional right to vote in this country. It's also the 200th anniversary year of the birth of um, Susan B. Anthony, our famous Rochesterian. So I'm really happy to be talking about Belva and Lockwood today. She is a contemporary of Susan B. Anthony. They knew each other. Um, she supported many of the things that Susan B. Anthony supported. When I first began to develop this presentation in 2014 and 15 for the Susan B. Anthony House, I have to admit, I did not know who Belva Ann Lockwood was. Um, despite all those women's history courses I took in college, um, her name was unfamiliar to me. And the more I found out about her, the more um, fascinating I found her to be. She is also one of those firsts. She was the first woman to be admitted to practice law before the United States Supreme Court. Um, but she's also known for other things too, um, and we'll talk about those a little bit today. Um, I did update this presentation in 2019 um, when I gave it to the Monroe County Bar Association, and I've attached, although I understand some of the materials didn't come through, we will make sure that all of the materials go out to you. Um, I've attached a lot of case law that is not only case law that relates directly to Belva Ann Lockwood, some of the cases that she argued before the US Supreme Court and other courts, but also cases that deal with um, women in the 19th century. There were a lot of laws and case law that um, basically restricted women's rights in the 19th century, and that could be their right to um, to, to work, their right to work outside the home, their rights to their children in the event of a divorce, their rights to an education, to a higher education, to enter professions, um, any profession, such as law in Valva's case or ministry um, or, or other professions. Women were restricted and the case law that I've attached to the materials really shows how they were restricted. So I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, there is a lot of case law. It's from the 19th century. Um, the wording is kind of funny if you read it. The judges make lots of interesting arguments, some of which are religious arguments against women um, moving beyond their sphere. But so if, if you're interested in case law, it'll be, it'll be an interesting thing to read. Um, so here we go. Belva Ann Lockwood. Belva Ann was born October 24, 1830 in Royalton, Niagara County, um, not too far from Rochester, Western New York. She's from the fourth department. She was born Belva Ann Bennett, and her parents were modest income people. Her father worked on various farms throughout Niagara County, moving from farm to farm. They lived for a time with Belva's aunt and uncle, and there is a log cabin um, where Belva was born. Uh, the grounds on which the log cabin uh, existed are still there, but the log cabin itself is no longer standing. In 2015, early in the year, I visited Niagara County, um, hoping to visit some of the historic markers and sites related to Belva and Lockwood. Um, because they're very proud of her. She's their native daughter, and she always, throughout her long life, she lived over 80 years, she was always um, going back to Niagara County every summer. She knew a lot of people there. Um, so I, I went during a blizzard, and I was unable to see a lot of the markers. Um, I'll show you my first slide here. There. Um, that's... If you can have, if you have any idea how tall the, the pile of snow beneath that marker was, it was taller than me. Um, and I wasn't able to take any actual pictures of the historic sites, but the, um, the historic um, museum there 
uh, Niagara County Historical Society has a lot of information about Belle de Lockwood. So they provided me with a lot of the photos that you're going to see in this presentation. The first one, um, there's the marker and behind it, there's another marker and there. Um, this was erected by the Girl Scouts of Niagara County. Near this spot stood the log cabin birthplace of Belva A. Bennett. She became the first woman to practice law before the U.S. Supreme Court and the first woman to run for the office of president. Well, the Girl Scouts were a little bit wrong there. Belva wasn't the first woman to run for president of the United States. Um, Victoria Woodhill had that honor. I think she might have been incarcerated at the time she ran for president. So she didn't, she didn't campaign. But Belva did campaign. She, run a, she ran a full platform. She went around to various states giving speeches. She had a 15-point platform, which was a lot for the day. And um, so she, I guess, is the first woman to actually run a full campaign and possibly, you know, get votes at the time. So let's see. Um, the next photo, this is Gasport Academy. It's a school where Belva attended and she also taught there. So Belva was very um, smart. She wanted to continue beyond the local school when she turned 14, but her family did not support that. So she had to start working at the age of 14 and she became a teacher. Um, and then she did what a proper daughter of working class means did at the time. She married an up and coming farmer, Uriah McNall, and about a year later, they had a daughter. Um, decades later, in an essay that Belva wrote, um, she comments on marriage. She writes in an essay titled, My Efforts to Become a Lawyer, that marriage of an ordinary woman is the end of her personality, her individuality of thought and action. A woman is known by her husband's name, takes his standing in society, receives only his friends, is represented by him, and becomes a sort of domestic non-entity, reflecting her husband's religion, moral and political views, and rising or falling in the world as his star shall go up or down. Nevertheless, Belva distinguished herself from these ordinary women by describing her interest in books and in writing, and she called these her unwomanly habits. Within the first four years of Belva's marriage, her husband died of um, injuries from a serious accident, and Belva became a young widow with a child to raise. She had a small um, amount of insurance money from her husband's death, and so she decided to pursue her education. She began studying at Gasport Academy, which you see in the photograph, and later she taught there, and she did so for half the pay of a man. She complained to her Methodist minister's wife that she wasn't being paid the same as a man. And the minister's wife told her, my dear, it is the way of the world. After finishing at Gasport Academy, she decided to enroll in Genesee Wesleyan Seminary about 60 miles away from um, Niagara County. Her family was very much opposed, uh, but she did it anyway. Genesee Wesleyan later became part of Syracuse University and Belva received an honorary Doctor of Laws from SU in 1909. While at Genesee Wesleyan, Belva attended local law lectures by a local attorney. She heard Susan B. Anthony speak about women being allowed to work outside the home. And upon graduation from Wesleyan, she began her formal teaching career. She taught in schools all over the area, in Lockport, in Gainesville, and in Hornell. She bought a female seminary, the Owego Female Seminary, 
and um, she was active in teachers conventions where she met Susan B. Anthony. Um, she supported educational reform and co-education. And while teaching, she's, she was an advocate for calisthenics for girls in girls' schools. This was not always um, accepted by many of the principals of the schools where she taught, but it was something that um, another famous 19th century uh, educator and public speaker, Catherine Beecher, was advocating for girls rather than tight corsets and limited activity. Um, she was advocating for calisthenics and movement and free movement and looser clothes, and, and Belva and Lockwood supported this. By 1866, Belva decided to move to Washington, D.C. She ran a ladies' seminar out of Union League Hall, um, and this was a great location for Belva. Union League Hall was a big place. It had lots of room. She was able to not only run her, her school, but she was also able to earn income from renting out rooms to other civic-minded groups and people. Um, she rented them out you know, for women's suffrage, for other groups, so she, she was able to earn a living. But Belva didn't get a lot of satisfaction from teaching. What she was really interested in was politics. And one of the first things she did when she got to Washington within the first few years was she um, lobbied for a bill, the Arnell Bill, that allowed female federal clerks to earn the same salary as men. This bill was debated in the spring of 1870, and it was a huge effort on the part of Belva to lobby it. She learned a tremendous amount from working on this bill. And although in the end it passed, it didn't actually raise the um, salaries of women, but it did allow women clerks to apply for any level of clerkship and to earn pay commensurate with that level. So, so it was helpful to women in the long run. While in Washington, Belva learned about the importance of connections. She became well acquainted with female journalists, abolitionists, and peace activists. She married Ezekiel Lockwood in 1869, and he was an interesting character. He was 30 years older than Balba, and he was very well connected. He was a former army chaplain, a dentist, a notary. He took in money by filing papers and serving as a rental and a pension agent. He got Belva involved in these activities too. One of his connections included the president of Columbian Law School, President Sampson, and Belva was invited to a series of lectures by the president. And this really piqued Belva's interest. She decided she wanted to become a lawyer at 39 years of age. So she applied to Columbian Law School but was rejected because she was told that her very presence would detract from the attention of the young men. Now here's a middle-aged woman who wants to go to law school and these young men, 20, 21 perhaps, are, so, are somehow going to be so affected by her presence that they, they have to exclude her. Well, she wound up at National Law School that is now George Washington Law School. And um, part of her way, the, her way through the law school, the male students complained they didn't want to sit in a class with women. Um, so she had to take some of her classes separately from the men. But she did graduate in 1873. And upon her graduation, she was refused her diploma. She was absolutely furious. She was at the top of her class and they wouldn't give her her diploma. So since National Law School, um, the de facto president was the president of the United States, she wrote a very pointed and somewhat rude letter to President Grant and she demanded her diploma. And surprisingly enough, within a couple of weeks, she got it. 
Um, upon receiving her diploma, she was immediately admitted to the District of Columbia Bar in 1873. She was the second woman admitted to practice there. And the DC courts were glad to have her. Her practice was varied. She handled criminal cases in the police courts, all kinds of criminal defense from low level murder, from low level cases to murder cases, um, forgery, fraud, seduction, breach of promise, as well as usual things, civil cases like wills, estates, deeds, pensions, divorces. She also served as the court appointed guardian for many children, some of whom were the children of her clients. Her clients were a multiracial group of working class laborers, painters, um, maids, tradesmen. These people were unable or unwilling to pay higher legal fees to a man, but they were happy to have a woman attorney. <clears throat> we have another picture here. Um, oops. Let's see. We'll go back one. Um, this, is, this is just another, um, this is another uh, historical society marker in Niagara County. And then after that, you'll see a piece of Balva's letterhead, which I found in the archives of the Niagara County Historical Society. And then she advertised for work, um, applying for pensions for family members of soldiers who had died in um, the war. So she's here advertising for pension cases. And then you'll see a photograph of Belva. She had this two, well, it's a three-wheeled bicycle, essentially, that she, she drove around Washington, D.C. She believed in physical activity. And uh, so she, she rode her bicycle around to courts and, and uh, to the clerk's office, where she was always filing documents and, and things like that. Later, um, after she, she got a, a bigger office, she moved to F Street. And F Street was where she lived, worked, and rented rooms. It was a 20-room house, four stories high. Um, she hired other lawyers to work with her. It's parallel to Pennsylvania Avenue today. So it was a great location. There were lots of lawyers there at the time. There was lots of competition for cases. Um, and she, she thought it was a great, a great location and it had showed that she had really made it into um, the strong middle class practice um, of law. In 1873, Belva sought admission to the Court of Claims. Um, she was denied. The judges wrote the reason for her denial was that you are a woman. You're a married woman. In other words, your husband is responsible for what you do, not you. And so you couldn't possibly practice in our courts. The court said that they were without power to admit a woman and that a woman was without legal capacity. The court's reasoning was statutory construction. The rule of the court was that no counsel will be permitted to practice in the court unless he is a man of good standing and good moral character. Um, they said that the court's rule contemplates only the admission of men and that the statute, a statute can never be extended to a new subject matter nor used to alter what under prevailing usage exists by giving to it to its words a meaning which so far as regards that statute or that subject matter they were never before supposed to possess. The court said it would not act on her application um, because a court is without power to grant such an application. The problem was Belva had a case that needed to be argued before the Court of Claims. She represented a Charlotte Van Court who had a patent issue. Um, it involved her deceased husband's patent for a torpedo boat. Um, so Ms. Van Court actually had to argue the case herself and read her own brief into evidence before the court. 
there are a lot of um, references in many of the cases before courts across the country that denied women the right to admission in those courts. And they all start with the Bradwell versus State of Illinois case, the case of Myra Bradwell. And this case is cited for decades um, after it was decided in 1872. It came before the United States Supreme Court and it's one of the cases that should be included in your packet of materials. Myra Bradwell was a um, accomplished woman in the state of Illinois. She, she had a lot of different roles. She, she was a writer, an editor, she worked for a newspaper. She also had a husband who was a lawyer and she um, studied for law um, in his law practice and back then, Going to law school wasn't the only way to become a lawyer. You could actually study with a lawyer and then be admitted to practice law. So Myra studied with her husband and she applied to the Illinois Bar for admission. Her case went all the way up to the US Supreme Court and the courts commented as they denied her admission that as a married woman, she would be bound neither by her express contracts nor those implied contracts, which it is the policy of the law to create between attorney and client. The US Supreme Court said that to admit women would be to exercise power not contemplated by the legislature. They went on to cite the common law of England, the basis of our own laws, did not provide for female attorneys and the same would be considered astonishing, they wrote. They went on with a religious argument to say that God designated the sex, designed the sexes to occupy different spheres and that it fell upon men to make, apply, and execute the laws. Um, the opinion of the court was written by Justice Miller who said that privileges and immunities clause doesn't apply here. It has no application to a citizen of the state whose laws are complained of. And it re relied on the slaughterhouse cases, which actually had been decided, and they are the case immediately preceding the Myra Bradwell case. Um, in those cases, um, basically kind of threw out the privileges and immunities clause. And um, they said the right to admission to practice law in the courts of a state is not a privilege or immunity of which states are forbidden to abridge. Practicing law is not limited to citizens and its protection is not transferred to the federal government. So if you're interested in that case, it is provided in the materials and the slaughterhouse cases are really interesting. Um, if you want a, a, an interesting one hour introduction to the slaughterhouse cases. There is a podcast by at the US Supreme Court if you just put in your browser podcast slaughterhouse cases. It's a really interesting presentation about all those cases. Justice Bradley concurred in this decision. Um, he said that the civil law as well as nature herself has always recognized a wide difference um, with the respective spheres and destinies of man and woman, and that the natural and proper timidity and delicacy, which belongs to the female sex, evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. The judge went on to cite the constitution of the family organization, which is founded on the divine ordinance, indicates that the domestic sphere is the properly belongs um, to womanhood. Um, so they, they just weren't going to admit her to practice. And actually, um, Myra Bradwell eventually, many years later, four years before her death, she was admitted by the state of Illinois to practice law. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, other arguments made by the justices, they're a lot of them are religious arguments, which you wouldn't find in case law today. Um, they also ju just base it on what they think is the nature of womanhood. They say a married woman is incapable without her husband's consent of making contracts, which was a fact at the time. Um, they also say the paramount destiny and mission of woman 
are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. So this is kind of interesting language to find in a court case. Um, you wouldn't find that in cases today, but in the 19th century, that's what they were arguing to keep women out of certain uh, professions like, like law. Um, let's see. So having been, uh, Belva having been denied admission to the Supreme Court, um, based upon cases like the case of um, uh, the, the, the Bradwell case, let kind of gave Belva an idea of what she had to do. She had to lobby a bill, um, and she did. And it was titled, An Act to Relieve Certain Legal Disabilities of Women. And the bill said that any woman who's been a member of the bar of the highest court of the state or territory or of the Supreme Court of the District of Columbia for three years and is in good standing and of good moral character shall be admitted on motion. This bill was set forth before the Senate by Senator Sargent, who, who argued before the US Senate that no man has a right to put a limit on the exertions or the sphere of woman. The enjoyment of liberty, the pursuit of happiness in her own way is as much the birthright of woman as of man. Um, within a few weeks of that bill passing, Belva was admitted to practice law before the U.S. Supreme Court. And I've included in your materials some of the case law, um, some of which Belva argued before the Supreme Court or other courts, and also, um, as I told you, that Myra Bradwell case is in there as well. So Kaiser versus Stickney, um, is one of the cases that Belva argued. She represented Carolyn Kaiser, and she ki tried to kind of turn the women's rights argument um, on its side. She said that um, the married women's properties laws um, applied, and that a married woman could not be legally bound to a contract that encumbered her own property because she was not able to validly contract. You know, women were not able to do things without their husband's approval. Once a woman married, um, her identity, her rights, everything were subsumed under those of her husband. So she tried to kind of turn the argument around and say, well, this property could not be encumbered because she was not capable of encumbering it. Um, but the court disagreed. They said that her husband had signed the encumbrance as a witness, and that was good enough. So the property was encumbered. Um, Belva handled a divorce case in 1873 for a Mary Ann Folker. Um, she won a judgment for Mrs. Folker and then reopened the case after she had done some sleuthing um, and learned that the ex-husband had planned to leave the jurisdiction without paying support for his wife and children. Um, that was a case in the District of Columbia courts. And that one, unfortunately, we no longer have a site for. There are some references to it, but I, I couldn't find a site. There was also a shooting case where um, Belva defended a married woman who had shot an officer of the law. Um, however, she had been told by her husband to do it. He told her, load the gun and shoot the first man who tries to force his way into the house. So she did so, not knowing she was shooting an officer of the law. Um, she admitted her guilt, but Belva's argument was, surely, gentlemen, you would not have a woman resist her husband. And the woman was found not guilty. Um, she also represented a prominent woman, Mary E. Gage, um, who was a socially ambitious matriarch of a prominent Washington family, and she was defended against lunacy, lunacy charges for threatening Charles Bell, a locally prominent banker. But Belva's most famous case and her second case before the U.S. Supreme Court um, was, was very well known, and it was U.S. versus Cherokee Nation Eastern Cherokee versus Cherokee Nation, 
and U.S. Cherokee Nation versus U.S. Um, this was a very important case. Belva represented the Eastern Cherokee in this case. It was her second case argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. Her first case was that earlier one um, at the start of her career that she lost. And then this case came at the end of her career when she was near 80 um, and she won it. And it helped almost, um, it, it helped the Eastern Cherokee who had been involved in that trail of tears decades before in the earlier 1830s, I think. Um, it helped them win a judgment against the US government for their forced relocation. And it also um, established that in interest could be awarded on judgments. There was a $5 million verdict at the time, which was very significant. Um, this was in the early 1900s. And uh, so, so that, that turned out very well for Belva. In 1884, Belva ran for president and um, both Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton refused to support her. They believe they should support a more prominent, well-known Republican candidate um, from a major party, and that was James Blaine. Um, I think secretly they believe that Belva was just out for notoriety. Um, but Belva took running for president quite seriously. She ran a full campaign. Uh, she had a 15-point platform. She, she campaigned in 11 states. Um, and the press really had fun with her. She was often mocked in the press, um, but she thought it was kind of fun. So she didn't, she didn't really have a lot um, to complain about. She took it in her stride. She actually got a few thousand votes in her first campaign for president. And this was at a time when women couldn't really vote. She ran again in 1888, um, but by then the novelty had worn off. She didn't campaign as much. Um, it's not clear that she had that much press coverage the second time around, and it's unclear if she actually got any votes. Um, I have a, a, a political cartoon. You can see, um, you can see it's, it's all about women's rights. It's the campaign. The characters in it are the people running for office. You can see Belva wearing the short dress over on the left and behind her is Susan B. Anthony. And then you see some of the other characters in it who were actually political candidates at the time. Let's see. Belva returned to Western New York almost every summer. Um, and she, she had a lot of friends there. Um, they all knew about what was going on in Washington through Belva and her daughter, Laura, who kept them apprised of all of Belva's activities in Washington, her cases, her caseload, what other things she was involved in. The Cherokee case had come late in Belva's life and she had to collect her fees from it, which was very difficult. She also lost a financially important case at the end of her life to someone with whom she had to share an attorney's fee, and that caused a financial hardship. Her daughter had died in the 1880s, and she was raising her daughter's children. Um, her house, the big house on F Street, it had mortgages, and she had to give it up when she was in her 80s. People who saw Belva toward the end of her life said that she had been living rough. She received a small endowment from the Carnegie Endowment, which helped her in her later years. Um, and upon her death in 1917, her grandson, DeForest Orms, threw away many of her papers and her personal effects. He brought several lawsuits to collect the fees that were owed to her, and um, I found several of those on Westlaw. Much is known about her in Niagara County because her daughter, Laura, kept an ongoing correspondence with the Lockport Daily Journal, um, their newspaper. She wrote letters back and forth and the journal published those all throughout Belva's life. Belva definitely knew how to use the press to her advantage. Um, here's a, a photograph of Belva in the center um, getting her diploma. 
um, from Syracuse University. And Belva also has a postage stamp. This is the first day cover um, of, of one of the two stamps that I, I actually have for her. Um, this is, there's the other first day cover. The ship that you're looking at is actually the SS John Brown, but it is a, a similar ship to the Belva Lockwood, um, which has been decommissioned. It's actually, it's no longer in existence, the Belva Lockwood, but it's a Liberty ship. And it was one of those ships that were um, developed during the war to World War II to deliver men and materials quickly to different um, different areas of, of fighting. And um, this one was, well, not this one, but the, another one was named after Belva. Let's see, and this is a portrait of Belva that hangs in the Niagara County Historical Society. Belva was the first woman to be admitted to practice before the US Supreme Court, but luckily she was not the last. Um, I was actually looking forward to being admitted to the U.S. Supreme Court on May 5th of this year, um, and then due to COVID-19, um, they had to cancel the admission ceremony. So I'm hoping to do it again in the future. But there have been many, many more women who have practiced before the U.S. Supreme Court, and of course today, we have women sitting on the court. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, there will be enough women on the U.S. Supreme Court when there are nine of them. And certainly we're not there yet, but we're, we're, we're getting there. And we're getting there thanks to women like Belva Ann Lockwood. And for any of you who are interested, there is a display at the Appellate Div Division Fourth Department um, devoted to notable women in the practice of law. And there's also an exhibition at the U.S. Supreme Court on Belva and Lockwood and um, other, other women who have been admitted to practice law there. So I hope you might be able to actually go see these things once, um, once we reopen after COVID-19 is behind us. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending the presentation tonight. Um, does anyone have any questions? Is it okay to have questions, Denise? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna in, unmute everyone so you can just um, ask a question if you have one. I'm s Katie, I can't unmute you, I'm not sure why. But everyone else here unmuted if you have a question. No, nope, no questions. Just thank you. Very interesting. Okay. I thought it was fascinating. I'm hoping you're going to write a book because I would yeah. love to. I would love to read it. It really was a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you, thank you. It, it, it was really fun to research her. Um, I spent about nine months part time researching Belva, um, and after not knowing her at all, it. It was just fascinating to find out about her. And she's from Niagara County, which, which I really liked as well. She's our, our neighbor here in Western New York. Um, and then I, I, you know, when I redid the program last year to look up some of the case law, um, I just found it fascinating. Um, and there are cases all over the country um, for decades, you know, after this that, that excluded women from the practice of law, and they still cite the Myra Bradwell case. It, they've, they've cited it decades later. Um, it was cited in U.S. versus Virginia Military Academy in the 1990s, I, I think. remember that one. Um, yeah, they're still, they, they cited that Myra Bradwell case. So it's just fascinating to see. Um, and, and once Belva was admitted to practice in the U.S. Supreme Court, she was still denied admission in other state courts. And you can find those cases in um, Westlaw. Um, she was denied admission elsewhere. So it's so fascinating. You know, I was just thinking about um, uh, an article that I read. Uh, it seems off point, but I wondered if, if that, uh, the, the progression of women 
Uh, I read in the New York Times Magazine several months ago about um, felons, convicted felons who get admitted to law schools, but then are not allowed to be admitted to bars, uh, mm -hmm. bars based on the, the, you know, the, I'm blanking on the word, but I, yeah. I'm just wondering if, if that would be a parallel type argument where they might go back and cite when women were excluded um, but allowed to be admitted to a law school because it seems to me really uh, unusual that you could gain admission to a law school where the people admitting you had a pretty good idea that you were not going to then be able to practice law. Yeah, that's a really interesting parallel. And I, I think it, it, it definitely has a lot of um, resonance here. We've got you know, in the 19th century, women really, they, they had no rights that allowed them, you know, to enter into these types of professions. They weren't allowed to make contracts. They weren't allowed to, um, to do a lot of things that we take for granted today. They weren't qualified to enter into professions. In fact, one of the judges in um, Belva Lockwood's case said, basically, you know, you, you can't do anything without the permission of your husband. And her husband was there to further her admission. He said, I approve, you have my permission to admit yeah. her. And they didn't care, you know? And so I guess the same is true with, with Fallon's who, um, you know, there's a good character aspect. Good of moral it. character, that's uh, right. And if you don't have that, then maybe you don't get in. Although you would assume many of these Fallon's have done their time, exactly. they've, they've paid their dues, they've lived a good life, they've, you know, gone to further their education, and that maybe, yeah, there's definitely a, a parallel there. Um, that's interesting. Who knows? Maybe we'll be seeing some of these cases pop up, uh, just like, you know, the Myra Bradwell case pops up every now and then in cases today. Maybe we'll start seeing some of those um, women denied admission to the bar because of their unfitness. You know, they weren't qualified. They didn't have the right skills. They didn't have the right anything. Um, maybe we'll start seeing those in those prisoner cases. That's interesting. Denise, it's Helen. I just wanted to say hi. I'm sorry I tuned in so late. I missed most of it. I was confused about the start time. So. Oh, Helen. Hi. Yeah. Glad. Um, to but thanks for letting me know about it today. Yeah, I'm sorry it was short notice, but yeah. thanks. I'm glad you could participate. Well, I just got a little bit of the of the in there. Sounds I'm a, I'm a big fan of Belva's. <laughs> yeah, she's a great, and she's from our department. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she's she's an inspiration. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okie doke. All right. Well, thanks and, so much. Okay. Well, thank you all for for attending. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.